Let's take a look at some more fakery. It's very rife from the internet, and to be honest, I quite enjoy the fake products because there's a certain element of fun to it. So these two bulbs were bought separately. It turns out they have both got the same codes on them. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, number 368554, 368554, but they're different. The LEDs are different, and the power ratings are different. The listing is for these typically reads something like this. 360 degrees sterilization, fast sterilization. E27, 60 LED UV sterilized light germicide corn lamp, kill dust LED ultraviolet lamp, home sterilized disinfect light bulb. The same sort of things. And they're not that expensive, which is probably just as well. And in the listings, they're shown as a deep violet, like they're going for the sort of at least the near ultraviolet. These ones are not. So let's uh, test these and then we'll open them up and explore them. So I'm going to change the lighting for this one moment. The lighting has been changed, so you can see the display better and it doesn't flicker, but it will now swamp out with these. The first exhibit is basically a blue LED light. That's it, it's just blue LEDs, and it shows us 6 watts, which is quite high for one of these little packages. I'd normally only rate these 3 or 4 watts. Um, current is 41 milliamps, and power factor is 0.6 roughly, which is okay. So let's plug in the next one. And this one, despite coming from the same listing, doesn't look that much brighter, but draws over 10 watts, 75 milliamps, and about 0.56 power factor. This, I wouldn't want to leave this one running too long. 10 watts is far too much for this. So watch your eyes, the light is coming back. The light is back. Now, to be fair, uh, research has been done into the use of both blue light and deep violet light in the use of refrigerators inside refrigerators for keeping stuff sterile. But all the research I looked at typically came up with the end result uh, was promising. We had some interesting results, but it uh, needs more research and need more funding. And that's the end of the research because ultimately they hadn't achieved anything. They'd presumably got a Petri dish and contaminated it and then exposed, well, I hope they did this, exposed half of it to like blue or violet light and then so seen what the die-off rate was. But to be honest, in that instance, they might as well just put it outside. The sunlight or daylight would have the same effect. Anyway, let us explore these. Now, these ones are the two parts. They've got the, ah, they are. Yep. They've got the driver. Now, this one is the... I'm going to try my which is which. The light-coloured pink one is the high-power one, the ridiculously high-power one. I don't even think this little driver would survive. Hmm. I'm going to short that capacitor out, just in case it has extra special surprises. It doesn't have extra special surprises. This is good. So that is the 6.8 megafarad it's got, 450 volt. I just thought I'd mention that. Now, what I should have done before... Oh, no, no, that came off quite easily, actually. Oh, that's because it's cracked. Lovely. But the construction of these is very typical, and this is where I think that the heat dissipation is over-optimistic. It's also worth mentioning, the size of the LED chips in these is tiny. They've used cheap LEDs, in other words. And they're roughly the same size. The one that's burning at 10 watts is just ludicrous. It's going to fry these LEDs very quickly, particularly given the heat sinking literally relies on this material just being stuck onto the the drum. The like, Well, basically, it's just wrapped around a heat sink like this. Hmm. And to be fair, compared to some of the other ones I've seen, it's wrapped on fairly well. So that comes up here, and I'll just crop these wires here. And then it's stuck onto the top here. And there's a hole through the middle. Well, there are no LEDs over that area. And uh, that's it. It's basically, it's a cut-out circuit board, piece of circuit board material wrapped around this core. And I think that might be where the heat has bonded the adhesive on. Interesting. Let's take a look at the driver and the other one and see how it compares. If it is a matching driver, and if it is, then, well, I'll reverse engineer the drivers anyway. They're going to be a fairly typical thing. They usually are. But let's see if they're the same driver and see if they're the same component values and somehow one's ended up almost twice the power of the other. 
I'm going to have to cut this tape off. It's it's very, very sticky. Doing well. Doing well here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm confident. I'm just going to short that with the fingers. Bzz. No, it's not going to charge. So what we got? They're different colours. Uh, this one was the lighter pink one. It, had, it did have a bigger capacitor. Um, but they're more or less, they look pretty similar, don't they? Right, tell you what, I shall take some pictures and we can explore them and uh, see what the circuitry is like. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. And we'll start off by looking at the LED array. So I'm just going to zoom down this. And I've got my super duper high voltage LED tester here. And if I apply the test leads onto the LEDs, it shows typical voltage about 86.7 volts. And if I wait long enough for it to step up to the next level, which it takes a few seconds to do that, it will then step up to a higher current and the voltage will go to approximately 90 volts. So 93 volts. Okay, that's reasonable enough. Now, if I then take the probes off and I start again, but I just apply it between the positive and this LED here, two LEDs light up. I don't know if you're actually seeing that. Tell you what, I shall turn the light off, right? And you will be able to see that. So I'll just probe around with 300 volt probes in the dark. And if I put them here, two LEDs light. And if I move one round, uh, four LEDs light. So they're wired in pairs and it is just roughly three volts per LED. Right, watch your eyes, the light is coming back. I shall just turn my little tester here off and get it out of the way. A very useful little tester, this one. It's quite um, impressive. I featured this in a video, the HWL300. It's uh, spicy. It's got 300 volts in output, but it is a very clever little tester. That is now out of the way, and we shall rip this up, and I shall zoom out at the same time. Let's bring on the schematic. Other things worth mentioning. This is machined. Can you hear that? So they've machined round this and on the end. More aluminium, more, well, more alloy landfill. Nice that they've gone to the extent of colouring it. Okie dokie. Let's bring in uh, exhibit number one is just one of the drive circuits. But if I show you exhibit number two, you'll see that it's almost identical. But the chips are different. I've gone for the brighter coloured one. I removed the inductor off the board. It says T1, but it's actually an inductor, just to make it clear what's happening underneath, because I was looking for diodes and things and not seeing diodes. So the incoming supply goes straight to the bridge rectifier without any fusing. The output goes to the capacitor, which is here, these two pins at the bottom. And then it feeds the chip. It's got a feed current sense resistor, 3.3 ohm in the chip, for the lower power bulb. And the positive also goes straight out this convoluted route to the LED via a capacitor that is not actually used in this design. The return from the LED is switched via an inductor, via the unit and via that current sense resistor. There is an extra pin connected to the negative, which I couldn't identify these chips, uh, but they're a clone of a clone of a clone. Uh, this will be for a resistor for the over voltage sense that it actually senses when the output voltage is going too high. Uh, in this case, they couldn't really probably use that because they've skimped. They have skimped on the capacitor. Let me show you the schematic. Anything else worth looking at here? Not really. Okay. Here is the schematic, and there's two layers of uh, values on it. The lowest power lamp, the 6 watt one, is the skinny text. And the higher power one, the 10 watt LED lamp, the one that was probably going to get very, very hot in use. Think soldier iron hot. And, well, yeah, it was going to grill its LEDs. It uh, is the darker figures. The, so it's the MLS2128 versus the MLS2121B. The LEDs are in parallel pairs, 30 pairs. The inductors, uh, for the high power one, it's 2.5 millihenry. For the low current one, it was a low power one, it was 3 millihenry. And then it goes to the chip, which has roughly the same pinout. Now, I was expecting 
I could pass across the LEDs. That it, facility is kind of there. Because um, it comes from... Yeah, there there is a facility to put capacitor across LEDs. That let's draw it where it would be on the schematic. It is directly across LEDs. So this is capacitor isn't there, but that's where it would be. And normally on these circuits, I would also expect to see a diode going up there, and I'm not seeing it um, up to the positive rail and down to there, right? But I'm not seeing it. So I'm wondering if there's a diode inside uh, instead which should be going from there to there. Actually, we can test that. We can test that on this little circuit board. So let me just uh, set this meter. I'll just zoom out a bit. Let's set the meter to diode. I will turn it on, because that really helps. I'm be going from the switch down to the inductor would be the positive connection up to actual positive. Is it going to be a diode? <laughs> there we go. There's a diode. Uh, so they have built the diode into the package just to save an extra component in the PCB. But in this instance, they've not not even used the capacitor. So I'll explain what's happening in both these circuits. In this circuit, the current is being switched from this pin most likely down to the current the current sense resistor pin. And current will then flow through the LEDs, but it will create a magnetic field in this inductor. So this will be negative and this will be positive in the inductor effectively. And it will be building up that magnetic field. And the process building up the magnetic field, it limits the current that can flow through the LEDs. Let's get down a bit closer to this. So I would guess that this resistor, which sets the power rating, effectively, of the unit, uh, is probably looking for a threshold voltage across it, probably 0.6 volts, at which point it will turn off. When it does turn off for a, a fixed time, the magnetic field on this inductor will collapse, and this end will go positive and that will go negative. The negative is already on the negative end of the LEDs. The positive goes through that diode inside up to other ends. So basically speaking, it's pulsing the LEDs both when it's turning the current onto that inductor and off. So they're just pulsing twice for every cycle. But there's no smoothing for that. No, I mean, this it's a very high frequency, but usually the capacitors uh, improves the efficiency a little bit, I think. What else is there to say about this? That's it. It's a super cheap symbol circuit in a super cheap and slightly scammy light bulb with claims of its germicidal activity. But in reality, it's just a very, very cheap LED bulb, a blue one. But there we have it. The construction's quite nice. But I wonder how many people have used these, given that they recommend it for use in schools and food areas. I wonder how many people have bought these thinking they are actually germicidal. That's just very, very unpleasant. But there we have it. Um, the insides of two rogue germicidal bulbs, one of which was rated for 10 watts, which was just a ridiculous amount of power in such a small package. Uh, the temptation would have been to actually let that grow for a while. But now I've taken everything to bits. Uh, but there we have it. Uh, interesting things to take apart anyway.